Abba Piman asked Abba Joseph this question. What should I do when the passions attack me? Should I resist them or should I let them enter? The old man said to Piman, Let them enter and fight against them. So Abba Piman returned to Scetis, where he remained. Now someone from Thebes came to Scetis, and he said to the brethren, I asked Abba Joseph if I ought to resist the passions when they approach me, or let them enter. And Abba Joseph replied that I ought not to allow them the smallest entry, but cut them off immediately. When Abba Piman learned that Abba Joseph had spoken to the brother from Thebes in this way, he got up and went back to Abba Joseph, and he said, Abba, I consulted you about my thoughts, and you have said one thing to me and another thing to the brother from Thebes. To which the old man said to him, Do you not know that I love you? He said, Yes. And did you not say to me, Speak to me as you speak to yourself? That is right. Then the old man said, Truly, if the passions enter you and you fight them, you become stronger. I spoke to you as to myself. But there are others who cannot profit in this way if the passions approach them, so they must cut them off immediately. The reason I wanted to begin with this saying from the Desert Fathers, <clears throat> it, first of all it involves Abba Piman, who is one of the greatest and most beautiful of the saints of the desert, and also Abba Joseph, one of his teachers. But secondly, it is one of those examples, and there are hundreds of them only coming from Egypt, and thousands and thousands of them coming from the entire Orthodox world. One of those examples where you learn why there cannot be one rule that is applied to every single one of us. There can be no one rule when it comes to ways to deal with our thoughts, our evil imagination, our temptations, our passions, even our prayer, even the way we approach people around us or the way we arrange our spiritual life, confessions, communion and so on. There can be not one single rule. The Church provides us with a general obedience which is mandatory to all of us. But the purpose for us is that under the obedience and with the guidance of a spiritual father, we find, we identify that version of the rule, that incarnation of the rule that serves us and helps us advance in our spiritual life. Everything in Christianity is about the incarnation. Everything bears a stamp of this great feast that is approaching us, Christmas. There is a general rule which is applicable and again mandatory to every single member of the Church concerning fasting and prayers and everything else. But we need to find the right incarnation of that rule for our own personal life, and that can only be done under the guidance and supervision of a spiritual father. And a spiritual father is someone who, have you noticed, is someone who loves you. That was, that was the foundation, that was the check of the entire conversation. When Abba Piman returned to Abba Joseph and said, why did you tell me one thing and you said another thing to the monk from Thebes? The first thing he was asked was, don't you know that I love you? Because in this love, you feel free to entrust yourself. You feel safe. 
you feel certain that the person who loves you in Christ is going to do everything for your salvation. Because they've reached that level where they speak to you as if they speak to their own heart. Am I not speaking to you as if I'm speaking to myself? Saint Joseph asks Saint Piman. But what I wanted to tell you today is I have heard your comments and I have received your emails and indeed I've had a few phone conversations with some of you who have a definite house in my heart and you are all asking for a rule of prayer and I have resisted to offer you that for this reason. Because from the beginning of Christianity, we know that these general guidance lines, these general rules of the fathers of the church have to find an incarnation in our lives. They cannot be repeated, they cannot be applied to everyone. It's as if you want a doctor to just give a treatment for your disease without the doctor knowing what your disease actually is. It is as if you want a doctor to say, no matter what the disease is, no matter what affects you, if it's a simple cold or a cancer, if it is a flu or COVID-19, the way to treat it is to get antibiotics or paracetamol or something of that sort. It will help some, it will not help many others, and indeed, it will, it will damage greatly, potentially fatally, others. Because while you get that paracetamol, if all you have is a headache, it might help you. If you have COVID-19, it's going to do nothing to you. And if you have cancer and you think that this is the medication for you, it is actually going to kill you. Because you need to look for a different doctor. You need to look for a different kind of treatment. It is important to understand that. And as you see from the very, very beginning, the fathers and mothers of the church, the fathers and mothers of the desert, knew that you have to find again the correct incarnation of any advice that applies and is helpful to that person in front of you. For some, it is useful to accept the battle against an evil thought, and to allow that thought to enter your mind, so you fight with it inside yourself. But for that you need to be a certain kind of human being, you need to be at a certain level in your spiritual life, you, be, you need to be at a particular moment in the evolution of your spiritual life. For others, it's more useful to not allow any entrance of that thought inside of you and to cut it off immediately. A rule of prayer is dangerous and I am convinced that not one single saint or spiritual father has ever intended for their spiritual rules, the rules of prayer, to be applicable to everyone. This does not come from a lack of love or a lack of care for you. It comes precisely from the opposite experience. Because I love you and because I want you to grow and I want you to find salvation and to heal all the spiritual scars that you may have in your heart. You need to put in the time, the prayer, the financial effort, the physical effort to find someone and entrust yourself to that someone, even if you are to see that person only once a year. You need to do that. And because, because you put in the effort and because you put in the, the struggle and the pain, then your heart is opened and you are going to receive the five words that that person has to tell you once a year as if he has downloaded in you an entire library. I see my spiritual father two or three times a year if God blesses me that year. In other years, I see him once. And don't imagine that when I go to see him, my confession lasts for 20 hours. 
My confession usually lasts for 10 to 15 minutes, sometimes much less than that. And it takes me, again, two to three days to get myself from the monastery on the island all the way to see my spiritual father and make my confession. And then it takes me two to three days to travel back. And that takes money and it takes time and it takes sacrifice on my side and on the side of the community, community because I disappear from Mal for a week. For 10 or 15 minutes of confession. But every word that is said is imprinted in my heart and on my mind, not because I have a certain ability to remember everything or to receive everything, but because God, in His infinite love and mercy towards me, like towards all of us, has changed my heart so I'm able to receive those words and put them in my heart. I... I remember the first time those those words struck me. I think it's in in the Gospel of St. Luke, when the Mother of God hears something concerning Jesus and she hears the words. And although she doesn't fully understand what they mean, she senses that there is a hidden, deep, prophetic meaning to them. And she puts those words into her heart. And I remember thinking, what a beautiful experience, what a beautiful bubble of love, silent bubble of love, where you are aware that something greater than yourself is being said, is happening right now. And although you don't fully understand the meaning and the importance of those words or that event in the moment, you understand that you need to hold on to them and you put this treasure in your heart heart and you guard it and you take care of it because you trust God that those words have not been given to you by accident and that event was not allowed to unfold before your eyes by accident and that person whom you hear or whom you meet has been brought before your eyes for a person. You trust God and you receive his gift and you guard it in your heart like a treasure and at the right time that treasure just explodes in you downloads in you like like a secret software of salvation and your being is changed by words you heard a year or ten years ago and this happens because you've put in the sacrifice, because you've put in the sacrifice of time and of sometimes hunger in order to travel to my spiritual father. I have to put money aside. I remember when I was a student in Durham and I had about a hundred and hundred and twenty pounds a month to pay for my food, to pay for my phone, which I needed to keep in touch with my monastery and my spiritual father, and also to put aside 20, 25 pounds a month in order for me to be able to buy those plane tickets all the way back to Romania so I can see him. The more difficult this experience is, the more it takes out of me, the more sacrificial it becomes, the weightier it is, if that word exists, the more weight it has and the more transformative their power, the power of those words and these meetings actually become. Two things are needed for prayer. One, to pray, just to pray, and two, to put in the sacrifice and the effort to meet and to entrust yourself to a spiritual father at least once a year or once every other year. And in the meantime, make your regular confession to your local parish priest, who I am sure is a brilliant man, who I am certain has enough wisdom and has been given more than enough grace to help you until you get to see your spiritual father. Make sure, if you can, that part of your rule of prayer is a read prayer. Something that you read, something that was written by one of the saints who lived 
as back in the history of Christianity as possible. Someone from the 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th century. Read the prayers of the saints because the words of prayers have a transformative power upon our spiritual being. And you do not want to be transformed according to the spiritual depth of someone who lived this century or three centuries ago. You want to be shaped by the words and the grace hidden in the words of a saint of the church. This is why it is important. And the church has given us paraclesis to the mother of God, the wonderful, wonderful acathist of the, of the good news, of the annunciation to the mother of God, the acathist to Christ. And these are again 6th, 7th century prayers. You have a collection, an entire collection of written prayers by yourself, an orologion, by yourself, a book of prayer from an Orthodox monastery or an Orthodox church and start using those words because they belong to the treasure of the heart of the church. The church heard the prayers of these saints and she took them the way the mother of God received the words about Christ and the church placed it in her heart and from this heart of the church we can feed ourselves to this day. Make sure that at least part of your rule of prayer incorporates the prayers that have been passed on generation to generation to generation by the church. Allow a bit of personal prayer as well, especially if you come from a Protestant background and you need to use your own prayers more than an Orthodox, uh, a born Orthodox needs to. Allow yourself to use your own words and to use your own experiences, but gradually try to shape the content of your personal prayer according to the content of the prayer of the saints. Try to allow the experience and the prayer of the saints to inform your personal prayer. And then the third part should be reading lives of the saints. Whatever collection you have, the menions of the saints, the uh, something like a collection of the sayings of the Desert Fathers, the See, I don't know, the collection of the lives of the saints from the Kiev caves in Ukraine, or the collection of the saints from Moldavia, or the collection of the saints from the Holy Mountain in Greece, or the collection of the saints who lived in Russia, in Divevo, in Seraphim's monastery. There are literally hundreds of collections of lives of saints. And if you manage to partition your rule of prayer, so that it incorporates red prayers, prayers of the saints, a part that is your own words and a part that teaches you how the saints lived, then that is a good, healthy beginning. That is a good foundation. And as you grow, and as you also begin to sacrifice time, effort and money in order to get to your spiritual father, whoever he is, wherever he lives, you will see the grace of God acting in you, changing you into this extraordinary person whom you've dreamt to become all your life and only now you see coming to life in your own life. May God bless you, my brother and my sister. May God bless you, whoever you are, however you are, wherever you are. May His grace just pierce your heart and your mind and your body. Be blessed, be blessed, be blessed. And don't forget that Christmas is coming and that there are people who are alone out there, in pain out there, people who have lost people whom they love this year. And they may be alone for this Christmas because of the lockdowns and because of the virus. Don't forget people in old people's homes. Don't forget anybody who needs your love, your care and your attention. The more 
you give of yourselves for your brothers and your sisters, the more God will empty himself and give of himself for your sake and for your salvation. Bless others with all your might and this blessing will come back and hit you and transform you beyond your wildest hopes and your wildest dreams. Amen, my brother and my sister. Amen. Amen.